Uh, we're going to talk about starting ministry. Okay? Uh, there may be people here. There may be people listening by internet. And they're thinking, if I want to work for God, then how am I going to go about working for God? So this morning, I'm going to take a few minutes. And what we're going to talk about is what ministry is, how it should be done, and how to get started in it. Amen? Because I'm going to tell you something. Each and every one of you out there listening to me, you ought to be a minister. Now when I say minister, I don't want you thinking that you all got to be behind a pulpit, or that you all have to be singing, or that you all have to be doing something within the four walls of the church. That's not what I'm talking about. But you as a Christian have been called to minister. Amen? And that's what we're going to be talking on today. Acts 13, 1 through 4. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence sailed to Cyprus. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you have done for us. And I pray today that the words that I speak would go into the hearts of the listeners. And Lord, Father, that it would bear much fruit. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a grace, a hunger, and Lord, Father, a desire to serve you and to be about your business. Lord, we know in these last days, Father, that there is a harvest coming, Lord, and that we want to be part of that harvest, Lord. So make us hungry, Father, and make us willing servants unto you in this field in which we have been given the world. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want you to kind of have a clear understanding of what ministry is, okay? And from things that I have seen in my life, from things that I have seen in ministry, from things that I have saw on TV and the internet, is that many people want to put a worldly emphasis and a worldly definition upon ministry, even in the church, Okay. It seems to be a mixture of what would be called the ladder of success and the American dream philosophy with a lot of churches and a lot of ministers in the church. And I want to give you clarity on what the Bible talks about when it says ministry. Okay? Because we don't want to do ministry according to this one or ministry according to that one, ministry according to this group or that group. We want to do ministry according to the way God says do it. Amen? We want to do the things that please the Lord and benefit mankind. And so it seems that ministry is a glamorization of dynamic speakers Large churches, extravagant wealth, popularity with the world, and a lot of times we even see new age beliefs in ministry that kind of go along with this wealth idea, bringing it in, calling it in, speaking it in, okay? And the idea behind this so-called type of ministry is if you do God's will you will eventually climb to the aforementioned heights that I have spoken of. But do we find that in Scripture? What is the pattern and type of ministry that we see in the New Testament church and in the epistles after it? Amen? Now, the word ministry is diakonia in the Greek, and it basically means this. Servant, service, and attendance. Amen? 
Simply put, ministry is serving God in obedience by serving your fellow man. That's ministry. And there's no need to put glamorous lights behind it. There's no need to put big money behind it. It is simply serving God the way God says serve Him and serve your fellow man. You should serve God and man in humility and not pride. When you serve in pride or self-exaltation, we pervert or we twist what ministry really is. Amen? It becomes about self and not God. Or serving, it's not about self or serving God. Excuse me. Uh, It becomes about self and not God and not about serving man when we decide to get pride mixed in it. It's look at my big church. Look at my big money. Look at my big organization. Look at all the power. Look at the popularity. And look at the influence that I have. That's what happens when pride gets into ministry. Is that it is no longer about God or about loving your fellow man. It all becomes me-centered. You see what I'm saying? And who's the model of pride? Satan himself is the model of pride. And we look at him, and it was all about Satan, amen? Mm -hmm. I will, I will, I will. Mm -hmm. And so, when you get into ministry, and you get prideful, guess what? Ministry is going to stop going upward and outward to your friends, and to your family, and to loved ones, and to sinners, and it's all going to start coming back to what about me? Okay. Look at Luke 22 and 23. Luke 22 and 23. And they began to inquire among themselves, these are the apostles, which of them it was that should do this thing? And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto him, Jesus said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief chief as he that doth serve. So what are we seeing here? is that Jesus says that if you're going to be great in the kingdom of God, that if you're going to be a minister in the church, that your greatness is going to come from you serving others. That's where your greatness is going to come. If you're going to be a minister. Because ministry and being a minister is not this big glamorous thing like we see so many times on TV. It is actual work. For God. Ministry in the early church was preaching the unadulterated gospel to the many or to the few. Paul, Peter, James, all of those were just as likely seen preaching to two or three people as they were the thousands. Amen? And you can't get some people to come preach at a church unless you pay them enough money to get there. If the church ain't big enough, they ain't going to come. So let's understand something. Is that when you're a minister, you minister to who needs ministering. Amen? Whether they're rich whether they're poor, whether they're beautiful, whether they're ugly, whether they stink, whether they smell good, if they need the Lord Jesus Christ, you should be there to minister. Amen? Ministry in the early church was strengthening the church. 
through Holy Ghost filled preaching, teaching, example, gifts of the Spirit, and meeting the physical needs of others. It was also undergoing hardship in order to accomplish this task. And this is what we don't want to hear. Is that to be a minister, a good minister, you're going to have to undergo some hardship to do so. It's not all going to be roses. It's not all going to be peaches and cream. When you see a person minister, uh, a singer, a preacher, someone doing practical work in the church, you don't really see the hours of work that goes into the finished product. Amen? Just like when that new Ford or that new Chevrolet pops out of that assembly line at the end of that building, it's beautiful and it's nice and it's good to drive, but you don't see the process on the inside to get the finished result. Amen? And so, in order to be a minister, there has to be an effort put on the part of the person in ministry. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 11, 23-28. Listen to Paul's qualifications of ministry. Are they servants of Christ? I'm reading this in the NIV. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder. Been in prison more frequently. Been flogged more severely. And been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in dangers from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Listen to what he says, verse 27. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked and besides everything else, I face the constant care and the pressure that comes from the churches. Now, notice this. Paul didn't jump up and say, my qualifications for ministry is that I have a 5,000 member church. That's not what he said. He didn't jump up and say, I have a, 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 a degree from Harvard Seminary. He didn't say, look at my beautiful clothes, look at my beautiful car, look at my beautiful life. I've made it. I've reached the top. These are my qualifications. No, that's not what Paul said. He says, I've endangered my life to get this gospel out. He says, I've gone through hardships, toils, and troubles this whole ministry that I've had. Those are the qualifications that I would like to have in a minister. Amen? Now, I'm not saying every person that goes into ministry is going to have to go through the same things that Paul went through. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is this, is that if you think that you're going to become a minister in the church, a preacher, a teacher, whatever that may be, and it's just going to be some little dilly-dally thing you're going to do to earn a few extra bucks on the side, or to become some great famous person, guess what? There's a little more to it than that. If you do it the Bible's way. If you do it the right way. So what is the goal of biblical ministry? What should we be putting forth our honest effort in? 
What should we be expecting when we minister? This is a good question to ask because if I'm about to get into something, then I want to know what it is is expected of me and what the results may be from my work. So, excuse me, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 gives us our goals as we minister. Listen to what the Bible says. And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now this is Jesus after He ascended up on high. He gave gifts to the church. And we're going to find out what those ministering gifts are for. Okay? It says they are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, in verse 13 he says this, Till we all come unto the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. As minister, you are to save souls. You are to bring the knowledge of the salvation of Jesus Christ to the world. That's, that's one of your goals right there. Is that wherever you're at, if you're on the missionary field, if you're in the church, if you're shopping at Walmart, you're going to the mechanic to get work done on your car, wherever you're at, you're liable to be a witness to Jesus Christ. That's what ministers do. Amen? Is that they save souls. And you got to get all this, I'm so worried about what people will think of me out of your heart to be effective in this type of ministry. And, and let me jump ahead just a little bit in my sermon. Is that we see that beforehand that Peter, like Brother Eubanks was talking about, denied the Lord before the little girl there who said, you know Him? And he says, no I don't. And denied three times. But afterward, he stands before 3,000 people and preaches the gospel and stands before the Sanhedrin and is beat. How did he do that? He didn't do it in himself. He done it through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Two, it says, the perfecting of the saints. A minister needs to be able to minister to an individual person. Here, an individual saint. Someone who's going through hardships. Someone who may need things. You're there to minister. You're there to service. You're there to be uh, uh, an attendant to help them with these things. And then it goes on to say this, for the edifying of the body. Not only do we minister to saints singly, but also we can be called to minister to the whole body. A whole church. And then we see the work of the ministry that these five gifts and others are for the serving workers in the body of Christ. Now let me say this. Is that though the goals are the same for each and every person who decides to enter ministry, the results are going to vary. You can't watch Mr. I got a 10,000 member church and I'm driving a Rolls Royce, and think every church and every minister ought to be that way. Because that is not right. Just like you wouldn't look at every missionary that's over there in a third world country, living in a mud hut, and preaching to natives, not every ministry is going to be like that results are going to vary. I'm trying to remember this correctly. But when Jesus taught the parable of the talents, 
those talents that he gave to those people bore different amounts, did it not? And those who received the greatest reward were those who worked for the Lord. But those who went and buried their talent in the ground received no reward. There was no work done. And so we see that there is a correlation between how hard we work for the Lord, the effort we put into our ministry, and the results that we're going to get. So not every ministry is going to bear the same results but the goals are always going to be the same. Save souls and edify and build up the body. Amen? Now this next point I'm going to make, I want you to take this to heart, and I've mentioned it a few times since, but... If you're going to go into ministry, you have got to get your mind wrapped around this and you've got to abandon yourself to it. It's simply this. Ministry is work. It's work. At times, it's going to be wonderful and people are going to love you And they're going to shake your hand. They're going to kiss your cheek. They're going to tell you how great you are. And at other times, people are going to hate you. And people are going to run you down. And you're going to be tired. And you're not going to feel like doing what God's called you to do. But a good minister... It's going to go through it all. Hopefully with a good attitude. But not always. Hopefully with a good attitude. You must put forth mental and physical effort to accomplish the goals of ministry. You're not going to get anywhere without it. Do not think that you have something to do In ministry, whether it's preach a sermon, sing a song, whatever that may be. And all you're going to have to do is sit on your rear end at home and watch TV and eat potato chips. Because when you get up to ministry, you are going to fall flat on your face. There has to be work put into ministry. There has to be training put into ministry. There has to be books read and studied and people listened to and you got to get out and do it and learn from your mistakes. And that's how ministers become polished and good at their job. If you're going to have an effective lasting effect on sinners and the church, you must put blood, sweat, tears in your ministry but you must also put love in your ministry. Amen? Go to John chapter 10. If anybody knows anything about ministering, Jesus Christ knows about ministering, right? He is our apostle. He is our prophet. He is our pastor. Amen? He's everything we need Him to be. And here, he's talking about being a shepherd and how he's the good shepherd. There are good shepherds and there are bad shepherds. He's the good shepherd. Listen to what he says. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. 
The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known of mine. So what do we see here? The hireling is not a shepherd. The hireling may say he's a shepherd, but the shepherd loves the sheep. The shepherd is in the ministry for God and for those they serve. But notice this, that the hireling, he's just there to make a buck. And as soon as things get rough in his ministry, what's he do? Cuts tail and runs. Because the lion or the bear is getting near. And he don't care nothing about the sheep. You got that? So if you're going to be a good shepherd, you got to love God, you got to love the people, and you got to be doing it out of a heart for them not to get a paycheck. Man. It bothers me. Because I have heard people say, well, why don't you go into a career of ministry? Ministry's not a career. It's not something you go to school for to pay and, and to go and, and work in a church to get money. That's not what it's all about. You see, in America, we want to take this model that has been made up is that you go to elementary school, you go to college, and then after you do that, you go and get a job. Alright? And we want to apply that to the church. Or we want to apply a business model to the church. And God says, that's not the way I do it. A man can go to school, a man can learn to preach, and not be called by God and be wasting his time and receive no rewards in heaven for that, because God says, that's not where I put you. That's where you chose to go. Am I saying that schooling is bad? No, not necessarily. Am I saying that it's bad that the church pay the ministers? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm talking about the heart of the matter. Why are you doing it? You don't do it for money. You don't do it for fame. You don't do it for notoriety. You do it because you love God and you love people. Amen? Amen. I'll tell you. <clears throat> I'll tell you this, and I'm going to stop after this. And we'll pick up tonight. I was going through a, a rough time in my ministry. I won't name you where it was at, but I was having a hard time. And it seemed like no matter what good thing I would do, that I would be rewarded evil for that. And I really sit down and I contemplated quitting. Not going back on God, not stopping being a Christian, but saying fooey with ministry. Because I got tired of trying to do my best to bring the Word, live right, and nothing but bad crap happened to me for doing that. One night, I was in this thinking about it state. And I went to sleep. There's a guy that I worked with that was an alcoholic, He was a sinner. Wasn't no way around it. He didn't care. That's the way he wanted to live. Okay? And to me, he kind of represented a certain type of person. A sinner. Someone lost. I laid down that night and I went to sleep. And God gave me a simple dream. Didn't last, but like that. I saw this man looking at me 
and said, Josh, don't quit. We need you. And I know it was of the Lord. And God did not send me a dream with a big stack of money going, don't quit, Josh. You need this. He did not send me a dream with a huge mega church and me standing in front of it with Bridget saying, don't quit. You need this. He didn't show me in front of television cameras and everybody screaming my name saying, Josh, don't quit. You need this. He said, don't quit. They need you. You see, your motive for ministry matters. And it matters whether or not you're going to do a good job and if you're going to bear fruit. And so before you even step out on that field of work for God, you need to get that settled in your heart that I'm going to do this out of love for Him and that I'm going to do this out of love for people. Not for what I can be benefited for it. Amen. Amen.